Good evening and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum at the Institute of Politics. My name is Julia Blank. I'm a sophomore studying government on the data science track at the college and I'm a member of the JFK Junior Forum Committee. Before we begin, please note the exit doors, which are located both on the park side and the JFK street side of the forum. In the event of an emergency, walk to the exit closest to you and congregate in the JFK park. Please also take a moment now to silence your cell phones. Please take your seats now and join me in a round of applause for our Institute of Politics Communications Director, Amen Gashaw. Thank you so much, Julia, and hello, everyone. Thank you for joining tonight's John F. Kennedy Junior Forum discussion on the global implications of China's economic growth trajectory. My name is Amen Gashaw, and I'm a sophomore at the college originally from Atlanta studying government, political economy, and molecular cellular biology. At the Institute of Politics, or here at the IOP, I'm on the executive board as student communications director, and also serve as one of the founding heads of our new IOP Coalition for Global Affairs, or CGA. CGA was born out of an appreciation for the international cultural and historical lenses through which I, as an Ethiopian American, and many other students have always viewed politics and policy. Through the coalition, the IOP aims to expand and enhance its commitment to spotlighting the role that public service plays in shaping our global society by creating opportunities for students to further engage with international relations as we define and embrace our roles as citizens of the world and so that tomorrow's world leaders can partake in the global conversations we have today. That said, I'm excited to introduce tonight's forum discussion. With Beijing hosting a second Olympics, China's identity as both an economic powerhouse and global influencer is indisputable. But its rise leaves numerous questions in its wake. Will China's meteoric ascent continue? And what does it mean for the US and the world if it does? On stage, Douglas Dillon Professor of Government Graham Allison will be joined by Kelly Sims Gallagher, academic dean at Tufts University's The Fletcher School. Dean Gallagher served as the Obama administration's senior China advisor and the special envoy for climate change office at the US State Department. On the two monitors above, we are privileged to have with us as well, Dr. Kei-Yu Jin, professor of economics at the London School of Economics, and she's joining us tonight from Beijing, China. Also joining us virtually, Charles W. Elliott University professor and president emeritus at Harvard University, Lawrence Summers, who served as the 71st secretary of the treasury for President Clinton, director of the National Economic Council for President Obama, and who today serves as the Vail director of the Mosavar Romani Center for Business and Government here at the Harvard Kennedy School. We're so grateful to all of you for joining us tonight and honored to hear from such an incredible group of guests as they discuss one of the most pressing topics of this moment. Without further ado, I'll pass it over to Professor Allison. So thank you very much, and it's an honor to be here, and uh, a pleasure to be back in the forum with real live people, so uh, fantastic. Uh, we have a great uh, opportunity tonight. Uh, if we compare the economic competition between China and the US, as if it were a series of events analogous to the ski jumps or snowboard feats that we're watching at the current Beijing Olympics, could China be winning gold? In the race to be the manufacturing workshop of the world, or the number one trading partner of most nations, or the source of innovations, including apps where most people spend most of their time. Who's winning gold? Yeah. A major report from Harvard's China Working Group uh, focuses on the great economic rivalry and tries to document what's actually happened in the first 21 years of the 21st century in the rivalry between US and China. The 10 questions in the quiz that we handed out which will be ungraded, let me just uh, let you <laughs> can relax, okay. Uh, ask about 10 key events in this economic Olympics. So the game plan tonight is for me to kick off with 10 slides that basically summarize the key findings from the report, essentially answering the 10 questions. And then the panel of distinguished experts will comment on the findings, agreeing and disagreeing, and we'll have a little discussion 
and then we'll turn and pivot to the future. So not just looking to what's happened till today, but looking ahead despite all the uncertainties. Nonetheless, the question is, should we expect China to continue growing at twice or more the rate of the U.S. over the decade ahead, the 2020s, or not? So the answer is yes or no, and each of us will give a chance to offer our answers. We're very fortunate. The introductions were absolutely on target, but I want to underline, if I could just for a second, to have such an extraordinary group of commentators. So Kelly Sims Gallagher uh, is the most knowledgeable expert I've read analyzing China's impact on environment, climate, and the consequences for economic growth. And if you were to ask John Kerry or uh, John Holdren, uh, who played the key role in the US-China climate agreement that led to the 2014 Climate Accord, they would say Kelly Gallagher. Kaiyu Jin is a professor at the London School of Economics, but who spends much time in China. Uh, and everyone who knows about Chinese economics that I know in the US identifies Kaiyu as one of the most insightful analysts of what's really happening in the Chinese economy. She's in regular contact with hundreds of influential Chinese and has a feel for events on the ground. And last but not least is our colleague Larry Summers. So Larry is not only former Secretary of the Treasury and former uh, Chairman of the President Clinton's, sorry, President Obama's uh, National Economic Council uh, and President Emeritus of Harvard and a Elliott Professor here. I think Larry is arguably the most accomplished economic policymaker and advisor about economic policy making that we have in the world today. I mean, that's a pretty stark statement, but I think that's right. And his latest claim to fame is what I'm deciding we should call him the inflation prophet, okay? <laughs> For having six months before Washington, policymakers were willing to wake up to it and were insisting on denying it, that what was coming was gonna be a great inflation which now has most of Washington frozen like a deer in the headlights. So we have a great panel. Let me take us through the slides here uh, briefly. Start here to remind you, this week is the 50th anniversary of the week that shook the world, as it was said, when Nixon and a Harvard professor who had gone to work for Nixon, Henry Kissinger, went to see Mao and Chow and Lai uh, and basically opened the history of the past 50 years. And you can see Napoleon's advice, uh, the argument for my book, Destined for War, and Nixon's nightmare in the last year of his life as he thought about whether we might have created Frankenstein's monster. Uh, so what's the difference between 1972, when Nixon and Kissinger showed up there, and today, if you look at the streets of Beijing, I don't know if you can see the bicycles, but you cannot see too many bicycles in the second picture. Hmm? Uh, in Sh Shenzhen, which is China's tech hub, which was pastoral in 1972, is now the third largest city in China by GDP. In 1940, a famous Kansas senator, Senator Weary, declared, we will lift Shanghai up and up and ever up until it's just like Kansas City. <laughs> and I think if you look at the pictures, you'll see we succeeded. Yeah? <laughs> so the quiz, uh, 10 questions. One, when Nixon and Kissinger arrived in Beijing 50 years ago, what percentage of Chinese were struggling to survive on less than $2 a day, which is the World Bank's criterion for abject poverty? So you can fill in or think about your own answer. And what about today? So second, today, who is the manufacturing workshop of the world? Three, 
who's the number one trading partner of most countries in the world? Four, who is the exporter of most essential links in the global supply chain? Who's the largest producer and consumer of automobiles, including EVs? Where does the colonel sell the most Kentucky Fried Chicken? And the fastest growing market for Starbucks, and for McDonald's, and for Papa John's? Seven, who's constructed more transportation infrastructure every year since 2008 than the U.S. has in the past decade? Eight, whose app shocked Facebook and Google last week and cost Harvard almost graduate Mark Zuckerberg $34 billion? Uh, who has the largest economy in the world? measured by the yardstick that both CIA and IMF regard as the best metric for comparing national economies. And finally, which country attacks, attracts the most talented inventors and entrepreneurs and gives them the most freedom and opportunity to realize their dreams? So those are the first 10 questions, as you'll notice. Uh, there are two bonus questions, which we'll turn to second. The first of which asks, looking ahead, will China continue? The, first, the past four decades, China has grown at roughly four times the rate of the US in real terms. So this is inflation adjusted. So in the decade ahead, would we expect it to grow two times or more? The answer is yes or no. Okay. And in the Beijing Olympics, if you've been following that, Who's going to win the most gold medals? Okay. We'll turn to the second questions after we've gone through the first ones. So if we go back to the first question, uh, if you just do it by the numbers, in real dollars, 15, 2015 dollars, uh, Chinese GDP was $260 billion when Nixon and Kissinger showed up there 50 years ago. It's grown more than 50-fold. So how many, what percentage were living in abject poverty when Kissinger and Nixon showed up? Uh, here's a little uh, graphic from my TED talk. On its march to the market. At that point, what percentage of China's one billion citizens were struggling to survive on less than $2 a day? Take a guess, 25%? 50, 75, 90, what do you think? 90, nine out of every 10, on less than $2 a day. 2018, 40 years later, what about the numbers? What's your bet? Take a look. Fewer than one in 100 today. Okay. This is a, an anti-poverty miracle. And for those of us that are interested in poverty as a condition of human beings, this is a human accomplishment. As Bob Zelik, a graduate of the school, pointed out when he was president of the World Bank, this achieved, in effect, the UN's millennial goal for poverty reduction just in one country. So what about global manufacturing output? Uh, if you look at this slide, uh, basically China's become the workshop of the world. That happened in about 2010. Uh, it accounts for 29% of global manufacturing value added uh, versus about 18% for the US. So if you look at the numbers, basically China produced two million computers uh, at the beginning of the century, uh, 2000. Uh, last year, 250 million. And we could go down other pieces. So next slide. Question, what about trade? US was the major trading partner in the year 2000 when the Clinton administration was exploring uh, and 
preparing the way for China to enter the WTO as a forward developing country. Today, China is the major trading partner of all the major economies virtually, and 10 of the top 15, including Germany, Japan, et cetera. Uh, in terms of the supply chains, if you look at this, and these are just uh, eight uh, indicators, whether it's rare earths or iPhones or solar panels or computers or electronic vehicles, China is the most critical supplier of most of what people buy that was made by somebody and many things that are natural resources. So in particular, as we think about the climate agenda that Kelly will say something more about, uh, if the U.S. is going to meet its objective that President Biden has stated to switch from combustion engines to electronic vehicles, America's green future uh, runs through red. So it will increase dependence on China in each of these arenas. Uh, the EV uh, race, as you'll see here, China produces most of the electronic vehicles and buys most of the electronic vehicles. GM sells most of its electronic vehicles in China. Tesla uh, sells uh, makes most of its electronic vehicles in China, sells most of its electronic vehicles in China. And as Elon Musk says, Tesla will, China will be Tesla's long-term biggest market. Similarly, Tim Cook at Apple says, our view is that China will be Apple's top market in the world. So, next slide. What about consumer items? Starbucks opens a new Starbucks in China every 12 hours. Every 12 hours. And the Colonel has twice as many stores in China as he does in the US. Construction. Uh, this is a whole separate lecture, uh, but basically, and drives me crazy, uh, China has shown that it can build transportation infrastructure in a way that's shameful for Americans. A high-speed rail, uh, there's an example uh, of the high-speed rail that they built in two years to connect downtown Beijing with the uh, Olympic Stadium. Uh, and compare that with the T ride home tonight. Yeah. Uh, and if you look at the high speed rail, we have none, and they have 23,000 miles of high speed rail. So they can go all the way around the world, this would take up for example. And we could do the other categories. Next slide the great disruptor. So when Facebook's board reviewed risks to Facebook two years ago, all of their worries were in Washington about regulation or about uh, the anti-monopoly or whatever. Something that was not on their screen was the idea that a Chinese uh, group would invent a new app that would become a more popular site than Facebook and Google. So I would say get used to it, okay? China can invent and create, and they did, and the consequences will be big across the board. And finally, who's got the g largest economy in the world? Go to the CIA fact book. You can just look it up, uh, uh, Google it, yeah? And you'll see, this is a page from it. According to their yardstick, which is PPP, which that's another discussion and debate, China has the largest economy in the world today. And I think that's correct. So basically, the uh, finding about these items is a lot of gold for China and not so much for USA. Now, since I'm hopelessly red, white, and blue, so I believe in our team, and I'm not about for giving up our team, I put a tenth question here, which is, next slide, uh, who attracts the most talent from the world and gives them the most opportunities? And you'll see here for immigrant inventors, it's USA. Basically, people leave China, and fortunately, some of the best ones come to the US. 
But if you ask why has the U.S. been successful in its technological predominance ever since World War II, uh, somebody should make a song which is called Not Born in America. Okay? So it's mainly because of people who were born in some other country or whose parents were born somewhere else and who have come to the U.S. and basically been the secret sauce for America. And I think fortunately, from my point of view, this is a great sustainable advantage for the U.S. because China insists on not naturalizing anybody. It was almost impossible to become a Chinese citizen. And the U.S., when we're at our best, recruit and welcome and give opportunities to people of talent from wherever they come and encourage them to realize their dreams. So that's the once through lightly and before we turn to the future. Let me start here on the stage with Kelly uh, and then we'll go to Caillou and then Larry for the wrap up if that's okay. Uh, Kelly? Yeah, great. Very provocative. I'm relieved I got all my questions right <laughs> on the quiz. Um, well, overall, you know, my take is that China has won gold so far um, in the economic rivalry because it's the largest economy in purchasing power parity terms, because of its very high rate of investment, which is really an investment in the future, its growing commitment to innovation and low carbon industries, the structural change in the economy, which has benefited the climate, they're going from high carbon to low carbon industries, and persistent efforts to achieve economic modernization. That's not to say that process, any of those processes are complete, but these are the trends. However, the growing um, economic prosperity in China has really come at a significant environmental cost um, for China specifically, and more broadly for the world when we, when we think about this from a climate change point of view, estimates of the cost of environmental damages to China's GDP range from two to 9%, depending on what's included in the calculation, water pollution, air pollution, climate change damages. The good news is that China understands that these environmental costs are real Nobody is disputing the science in China, so there's broad consensus about the need to act on climate. And China has actually identified economic opportunity in this threat, the threat of climate change, and has embarked on trying to develop the industries that will position it well for a low carbon century this century. Um, and to just give you a couple of examples, China passed a renewable energy law back in 2006 and amended it in 2009. And this laid the, the foundation for the takeoff in growth in the, in the um, wind and solar energy industries in China during the last decade. Um, and I'll, I'll give you some data in a minute about how dramatic the growth um, in renewables has been, but suffice to say that Today, China has far more renewable energy capacity already built uh, than the rest of the world combined. Um, by comparison, the United States has no renewable energy law. We have no climate change law. Um, but rather, we have a very confusing patchwork of state level laws and regulations. 30 states plus the District of Columbia have renewable portfolio standards. And they're literally all different. Uh, ranging from 15% by, by 2025 in Arizona, where I think Larry is sitting today, um, to 100% by 2045 in Virginia. Um, so just very confusing, mixed record in the United States, very inconsistent signaling to the marketplace. Um, and while President Biden has talked, you know, a good game, uh, about the need to have good quality, um, build back better jobs. Uh, in fact, China's winning the race um, for new clean energy jobs. In 2020, China generated 4.7 million new renewable energy jobs. That was 40% of all the new renewable energy jobs around the world. 
whereas the United States generated 838,000, only 7% of the global total. Um, in fact, the U.S. comes in fourth in creation of new renewable energy jobs behind China, Brazil, and India in that order. And most of China's new jobs are in solar, um, both solar PV and solar thermal, which is not something we talk about very much in the United States, but it's a very important um, opportunity. Um, and I would just argue the U.S. really slipped to silver um, because it hasn't had the bipartisan consensus about the need to make these investments in innovation, hasn't had the bipartisan consensus about climate change itself, like is it even a problem that we need to act on, um, nor the need to invest in human capital in these low carbon industries to develop the workforce that we need. However, I'd say um, neither country has meddled. <laughs> Um, in demonstrating a low carbon development model. Uh, both the Chinese and American growth stories are really compelling in their different ways. Um, you know, we, we look at, many countries look to the United States as a compelling post-World War II economic growth story. And I think today many more countries look to China and the China development model as for inspiration and in how to achieve the poverty alleviation that Graham was talking about earlier. But both of these growth models were very carbon intensive growth models and not ones that can be replicated anymore. Um, and I just recently published an article called The Coming Carbon Tsunami in this issue of Foreign Affairs, which warns us that if we don't identify a new growth model, a low carbon uh, development model, we will fail to achieve you know, net zero emissions in this century. Um, so, I think I'll stop there and we can talk a little bit more about the future in the Q&A. And Kelly, say again the, the title of the foreign affairs piece. It's called The Coming Carbon Tsunami. It's in the January, February issue. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. We should have put that in the, in the reading, but to get that. <laughs> so, uh, Kayu, would you like that come, come next? Um, <clears throat> yes, absolutely. I think, uh, from my perspective, um, as a Chinese, having grown up in China, um, of course, we saw this unbelievable transformation with our own eyes. When you know, I first got to the U.S. as a high school student, um, people only asked me about three things about China, Tibet, Tiananmen Square, and human rights. That was in 1997. We were seeing um, you know, our, our cities being transformed, debating about deep reforms in China and bidding for the Olympic uh, Summer Olympics uh, back then for the 2000 Summer Olympics. So we had a, uh, you know, a, real, um, a real perspective of things on the ground. But apart from what you said, Graham, uh, about poverty alleviation, which is so real, I would add uh, to the winning gold factor uh, something a little bit different and less discussed, which is uh, female empowerment. And um, of course, female empowerment comes with economic development, but the one-child policy, uh, the one-child policy generation, of which I was the first, among the first, uh, started in the 1980s, uh, did a number of things, of which the most important is contribute, or sorry, control the population spiral, um, but also led to much higher education for the only child of the family, but unexpectedly, um, unprecedented female empowerment, which is why we see so many female CEOs, hmm. female leaders in the political and uh, business uh, arena. Uh, and of course, uh, entrepreneurship is, um, is really quite unbelievable uh, in China. I, I feel that the, the growth uptake is quite simple in the end. If you give people three things, an incentive, which is to reward them for their efforts and their creativity, um, the, si the size of the market, which is vast, as Graham, you've uh, illustrated, and a stable political and macroeconomic environment, and you have China. And it's amazing how all three factors combined is so difficult uh, elsewhere uh, in the world. I think a third thing that China has done well is the Chinese government's accountability and responsiveness. Uh, which is uh, not exactly what we hear 
in, in broad, uh, broad stream media in the West and outside of China. But according to international surveys of all sorts, including uh, from the Kennedy School, the approval rate of the Chinese government has been consistently high uh, even until today. And uh, the, the, um, the, the checks and balances that go with uh, social media, the fact that you can criticize the government openly on public websites um, is all uh, you know, an indication that there is just much more responsiveness uh, on the ground from the Chinese government to, towards its citizens uh, than, than we um, imagine elsewhere. Um, and on innovation, lastly, I would just say that um, I like to separate the, the innovation aspect uh, between a technology, technology breakthroughs from zero to one and uh, creative adaptations, which is taking uh, one to N. And um, the caveat is I think that China has been incredibly successful at one to N innovations. If we think about all the internet platforms, the apps, um, they are mostly, uh, but not all, derivative of a more fundamental technology uh, invented in the US, but this is where China is going in the future, and I'm sure we'll discuss that um, uh, later on, which is to push for breakthrough technologies, high-tech technologies, which is very different from uh, fintech or um, you know the, uh, the likes of TikTok and Alibaba. Let me stop there, Graham. Thank you very much. It's great to have somebody right on the ground feeling and seeing, and the female empowerment proposition as a, a unintended byproduct of the one China policy, or most uh, mostly unintended, I never had had thought about before. That's a, uh, <laughs> making me <laughs> rethink this since it seemed to be such a strange policy otherwise. But in any case, Larry, thank you so much for joining. Larry, you need to unmute. To Larry, unmute. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Graham, and it's great to be with you and uh, Kelly and Kayu, and uh, to be back, albeit virtually, uh, in uh, the forum. I think my role is to be a bit of a dissenter here, so I'm going to play that role by making four points. Uh, first, I think the Olympics are a wonderful thing, but a terrible metaphor for anything economic. In the Olympics, there's only one gold medal winner. If your competitor slips, that's good for you. It's a zero-sum uh, game. It is the essence of economics that that is not true. And so I think framing things in terms of who's the biggest and who's the best is misleading as a guide to people's welfare is damaging in terms of its prospects for avoiding uh, conflict, and it's just not the right way to think about economic comparison. Second, I think it's very important to avoid conflating scale and level. The one thing that is beyond debate is that China has about 4.2 times as many people as the United States does. And that means on any indicator of total scale, GDP, number of good ideas, total manufacturing output, extent of trade with any other country, by virtue of having 4.2 times as many people, you would expect it to be uh, much uh, larger. In fact, if China has the same GDP that the United States does, that would correspond to its GDP per capita being about where the United States was in 1950. And if it has this, and since it has a much higher share of its resources devoted to investment and a much lower share devoted to consumption, it would correspond to its living standard, its consumption per person, being about where the United States was in 1930. And so I think the portrayal of China as some kind of super state is importantly misleading. That's not to deny that there's been remarkable accomplishments over uh, the past three, uh, two and a half generations uh, in China. 
Now, it might be suggested from the point of view of global power that it's not actually income per capita. It's actually total income or total economic scale that is dominant. I'm not sure that's at all right, and I would invite you to consider the following thought experiment. Suppose the United States all of a sudden included in its country all of Mexico and all of Central America. Would we be a stronger global power or would we be a weaker global power? We would surely have a higher GDP. We would surely have more manufactured goods. We would surely have more trade with everyone else. But I would submit that we would probably be a weaker country because of the internal challenges that would result. And so I think that the comparisons based on total aggregates are profoundly misleading for considering what it is that represents China's economic strength. And the fourth and last point I would make is that all of us, but especially those who make presentations like yours, Graham, need to be mindful of history. Let me just read you a quotation. This country today has a more smoothly functioning society and an economy that is running rings around ours. This book helps to explain why this country is the most dynamic of all modern industrial nations. Thus wrote legendary Harvard professor Edwin Reischauer about his colleague Ezra Vogel's depiction of Japan in 1988. The same year in which the Samuelson Nordhaus textbook declared that the Soviet Union was an example of how a socialist economy, despite being socialist, could nonetheless thrive and would within several decades, because of its continuing higher growth rate, surpass that of the United States. And so I think it is an incredibly easy tendency to evaluate countries that have been able to catch up from very low income living standards to relatively low living standards through highly disciplined, highly planned, highly directed strategies and extrapolate those trends in ways that prove to be very substantially incorrect. And so for these four reasons, because ultimately the prosperity of others benefits us, because we have been wrong in the past on these points, because China is still well behind us, I think that you portray China as an economic threat that should scare us in a way that, if adopted, could lead us in the United States in quite misleading policy directions. Great. Thank you very much. I think that I said we would have agreements and disagreements, and I think your perspective is extremely helpful. I especially applaud the historical reminder that both great economists, including your uncle, Samuelson, and Nordhaus, and great political scientists or historians like Ed Reischauer and Ezra Vogel have often made forecasts that turn out to be wrong. I would remind us of Yogi Berra's line that beware of making predictions. 
especially about the future. Okay? But it is also the case that uh, bets have to be made by many people about whether, for example, to invest more in China now or less, or to build more Tesla factories in China now or fewer, or to uh, open more Starbucks in China or somewhere else. Or, so uh, in the real world, as you know very well, eh, however uncertain, uh, there's three choices. You can uh, go longer or shorter or hold where you are. And uh, I think, therefore, trying to understand what's happened over the four decades and then looking to the question of what may happen in the decade ahead, however uncertain it is, is a useful exercise. And, but I think your cautions are extremely useful. And I think particularly in a political environment where the politics has turned hostile to China, even to the point of demonizing China, that there's a danger when trying to be very realistic about China's performance, that that gets translated into, therefore, China bad, and therefore, China threat, and therefore, reactions that could be very, uh, in it, uh, that could actually, in a word, fall into Thucydides' trap. So I'm on the same page with respect to that. We could probably debate the commentary here, but looking at the time, let me try to, unless one of the others wants to comment on each other's comments, I would turn us for a minute to the future where we can at least offer our, uh, whatever, the, whatever our hazy crystal balls lead us to think about whether over the 2020s, when we look back on it, will China's economy have grown at twice or more the rate of the US, or it will not have. Uh, so does anybody want to hazard a guess about that? Uh, or does somebody have a Delphic comment that could be that could be interpreted to be either one way or the other? Uh, I don't know, Caillou, do you have a you have a bet on that that you've reported, or Larry, or I'll say my bet as well, but I'll give you a chance to go first. Um, well, growing twice the rate of, of the U.S. depends on how well the U.S. does, uh, but I think it's um, under reasonable projections, it's highly uh, possible, uh, so that in terms of GDP, not in PPP terms, uh, China would be uh, matching the U.S.'s size by uh, 2030s early 2030s. Kelly, you thought thought? I'm not going to uh, hazard a guess here. I defer to KU. <laughs> so Larry, I know you uh, have been bearish in the past, and you presumably remain bearish. So, but give us your thought. Depends on who's taking the GDP statistics. On which? If I had to bet the Chinese government will announce GDP statistics that will no, be- No, no, the I am, no, the IMF and CIA. Yeah, the, the, IMF, the IMF and those will follow the Chinese government statistics. So if I had to bet on the GDP statistics that people will be accepting in 2030, China will have grown in the low fours. We will have grown in the uh, two range. And so marginally, they will have grown twice as fast on the GDP statistics that people will be looking at when they look retrospectively in 2040, I think that the Chinese growth rate won't have been 4%, and our growth rate will not have been substantially revised. And so uh, the, bet would, uh, the bet would flip to the other side. I think it's important in thinking about Chinese growth to recognize that China is gonna have something that's almost without precedent, a substantially shrinking labor force over the next uh, decade. 
And we don't have a lot of experience on the question of what that means for countries. The one experience we do have is Japan, and it's not a encouraging uh, read. Okay, good, uh, good uh, comment and useful. Uh, if I just offer my two cents on that, or I don't know, Kelly, you wanted to go first? Yeah. I just wanted to say, I think it's the wrong question, <laughs> just to push back, because I really think what we ought to be thinking about as we look at the next decade is the quality of growth or the content of the growth if we're taking the climate change issue seriously. This is the pivotal decade where we need to really transform economies and be able to be thinking about how we decarbonize economies. So really, how much growth is less important to me than the quality of the growth in terms of how it affects climate change and other development aspirations? Oh, I think that's a fair comment as well. I, if I'm doing my bet, uh, am long China, as I have been for now 20 years. Uh, and I believe that it will continue growing at twice the rate of the U.S. And I don't agree at all with Larry's proposition that this is simply a matter of fiddling the numbers. If Starbucks is wondering how many lattes they sell, they have pretty good numbers. And if Elon Musk is wondering how many cars he sells, he has pretty good numbers. And if Tim Cook is asking how many uh, iPhones are they making and selling, what's the number one iPhone uh, in China for sales? Uh, number one smartphone, iPhone. So I think their numbers, CIA works very hard on the numbers, and I think, again, uh, numbers from all governments leave something to be desired. But the general bet in the market is, for the people who are having the bet, is that China will continue growing at four and a bit, and the U.S. at about two. And I would say, if I were making my bet tonight, that's where I would be. Uh, so, Kelly, you wanted to say something else? No, that was it. Okay, let's go back to, uh, to Larry and Caillou, if you have any brief comments, and then we're going to turn to the audience. Yep. Yes, um, Graham, let me add something. I think one thing from the Chinese perspective I want to bring to bear is that we must not forget that the Chinese government, despite um, how it appears, is one of the most flexible and adaptive uh, governments with highly adjustable policies. So while I agree that in the short run, Chinese growth is a concern, partly by choice because of the need to bring up higher quality growth, including the environmental standards and common prosperity, reducing inequality, et cetera, and the pandemic, there, um, it is important to remember that the government will very swiftly adjust and readjust its policies um, uh, to include more um, uh, uh, openness uh, or to have more liquidity in the economy uh, in a very flexible way that other governments don't necessarily enjoy, including the US. And let me just finally say that apart from Larry's comments about the uh, labor force shrinking, Chinese productivity has been the major contributor to effective labor force growth, whereas in the last decade, decade manufacturing productivity has grown by more than 10%. And that is also as important as the reduction in labor force where we're gonna see everywhere else around the country. The, the other small, small comment on the labor force is at least when I last talked to Lu Ha, who's a Kennedy School graduate and who's playing a key role for Xi in running the economic program, he said, you know, wait a minute, we have a retirement age of 60. You have a retirement age of 65. So we can simply extend our retirement age to, make, to essentially compensate for the labor shortage that we would otherwise face. So my bet would be we'll see the, the retirement age extended. Larry, we'll give you the last word and then we'll take questions from the audience. Let me tell for the audience, there's two uh, microphones here on the, on the ground floor and there's two on the loge. If you stand up uh, and uh, ask a short question, but Larry gets the last comment before we do that. With great respect to those who've been in the intelligence community, they were entirely wrong on the economic growth of Russia. 
They were entirely wrong on the economic growth of those in Eastern Europe. They were entirely wrong on the threat posed by Japan. So my assumption would be that anyone who's seen as a potential adversary of the United States, they're likely to be uh, substantially wrong about. I agree with you. If you had asked me to predict where would, Star where would Starbucks sales grow more rapidly, where would Tesla sales grow more rapidly, I would have said China. That's got a lot to do with the fact that you've got an economy moving from 1930 levels of consumption up to uh, more modern uh, levels of consumption, which creates all kinds of opportunities for uh, consumer goods firms. Kay is right when she quotes the manufacturing productivity figures, but when people have looked carefully at total factor productivity, that is how much of it is really technological progress and how much of it is more and more capital accumulation that leads to uh, diminishing returns. Uh, my reading of the evidence is that the total factor productivity growth in China, every time I see the numbers, I'm surprised by how disappointing uh, it is. And in a way you confirm that Graham with your comments about the extraordinary level of investment that's taking place in uh, transportation. The truth is they're building a lot of high-speed rails that nobody can afford to ride and are costing an enormous amount, just as Japan was being envied for uh, infrastructure investments that ended up uh, having very, very low social product uh, 30, uh, years uh, ago. So uh, will China make enormous progress in the years ahead? I'm, I'm sure it will. Should we, think of the, should we think of China as a comparable economic power to us or as a place where a very large number of people uh, live and therefore there's a large mass of economic activity I think we should keep the second vision in mind as much as the first vision. Well, well said. I think the question of how economic GDP is translated into global power is a whole other forum that we should discuss and debate at some point. Uh, save, the, save the gold medals till later, if we can, with the slides. So stay with this. Uh, uh, and I think the... Uh, the proposition that historically countries with larger GDPs have exercised greater power in international relations is incontrovertible, but not 100% of the cases, and not directly. And so there's a whole discussion and debate to be had there. Now let's go to the forum here. The rules, if I remember, are say your name and identify yourself and one question per customer, and questions in with a question mark. So this lady here. Hello, thank you so much for your time today. Um, I really enjoyed the discussion. My name is Sama Kuba, I'm a sophomore at Harvard College. Um, I wanted to ask um, about the aspect of entrepreneurship. It was brought up earlier that, like, that you need incentive, um, a market, and stable politics um, in order to create what is now China. I wanted to ask about the recent crackdowns by the Chinese government, especially on their own private sectors, and how that affects the entrepreneurship equation, especially the element of stable politics. Great, great question, and I think that was Caillou's comment, so Caillou, could you give us a brief answer? Yes, um, all under the, the umbrella of common prosperity to reduce inequality, uh, anti-monopoly against the big internet consumer platforms. Yes, one does raise the question, uh, can you invest more in Chinese uh, uh, entrepreneurship and technology? The answer is absolutely yes, because what you still have is this entrepreneurial dynamism uh, based on incentives and the market, which is not um, uh, affected. If we look at the statistics, the private sector continues to drive the economy. And um, for every unhappy billionaire in China, uh, that has been reined in. There are many, many, many more happy young people and entrepreneurs thinking they have a better chance at becoming a millionaire or billionaire um, because of the chances that are offered to smaller and medium-sized companies. So all conditions are still uh, right for entrepreneurship. 
So uh, if we go to this lady here, please. year at the college and my question is as we talked about today there are a lot of advantages that the United States is kind of losing to China economically so what if anything can the United States do to catch up to China particularly in the growth in the incredibly important technology industry so what about for team USA and how could we win more gold is that the question Basically, yeah and if I were to win the short answer it would be uh, continue recruiting and providing opportunities for the most talented people from all over the world. Uh, I am, have a proposal that I've been pushing called the Million Talents Program, which is a knockoff of the Chinese Thousand Talents Program, but where the U.S. actually can recruit people from 7.9 billion people. Chinese have only 1.4 billion to recruit from, and we can give them a free society in which they can thrive, and China rarely can do that. So I would say that's one advantage. But I don't know if Larry or Kelly has other thoughts. I think, uh, Graham, you're absolutely right about uh, being open to talented uh, immigrants. I think we are sitting at one of America's great assets and, one, and an example of a sector that is of overwhelming importance where the United States is in an entirely different level than any other country in the world, and certainly an entirely different level than China, and that is the university sector. And the combination of academic freedom, free inquiry, freedom to argue, and uh, criticize com vigorously competing institutions uh, for talent is, I think, an enormous uh, asset that over time is uh, what shapes uh, destiny. That does not mean that we could not make a set of mistakes and there are trends underway in our society that I think are mistakes in uh, this regard that could jeopardize uh, that advantage. And it doesn't mean that others couldn't succeed in fostering the kind of academic and university and higher education culture that we have uh, in the United States. But I think we need to recognize it for uh, the staggering uh, advantage uh, that it is. Extraordinarily uh, talented um, young people uh, like uh, Professor Jin when she was much younger come to study in American schools and in American uh, colleges because they and their families appreciate how extraordinary an opportunity uh, it is. It's not the same thing um, in terms of people from the United States may visit China for a year, but they do not seek to have their training, their basic formative education uh, take place uh, in uh, the United States. The children of some of the most extraordinary, eminent, and powerful people in uh, China have over time chosen to study uh, at Harvard. One could not conceive of a similar thing taking place for the basic college education in the other direction. Frederick, and I think that's something we need to remember and remember with pride and build on. A good reminder, where did Xi Jinping send his daughter to study? We're not going to tell the answer. We're up in the loge, please. Uh, I'm Jay Hong Chu from the Harvard Political Review. My question comes in two parts and about two people. The first person is San Francisco-born, Stanford-bound, Olympic champion and bubble tea ambassador Eileen Gu, who has decided to represent China in the Olympics. Does that mean that the U.S. has somewhat lost its soft power advantage over China? The second person is Singaporean-born TikTok CEO Shou Zichu. 
if China is not having an advantage in terms of attracting talent, what if it turns to other countries who are jostling for bronze for that talent instead? Thank you. Okay, does anybody want to take a shot at either of those? Can, Can I just say something uh, that answers to the first part of the question about Eileen Gu? Um, although Larry and uh, people on the panel have uh, expressed their views about human capital attraction, one really key statistics is all Chinese students who have Harvard degrees, Princeton degrees, or have worked at Google and Facebook are returning to China. About 80% of them have returned years after their graduation. This was not the case at all 20 years ago with Larry's students, such as Fred Hu, um, staying uh, in the US is their top choice. So I would say that that is also an indication that China and the opportunity that it gives, the fact that the American dream is now found in China, is also a very strong indication of why people like Eileen Gu choose to represent China and choose to return to contribute to the Chinese economy with the best American education they got. Good. Well, and unfortunately, she chose Stanford, but other than that, she has a lot to recommend her. This gentleman, please. Yeah, absolutely. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Nathan. I'm a sophomore here at the college. Um, and my, my question is actually going back to more so the previous conversation about economics, uh, I guess specifically for President Summers and Professor Chin. I'd just be curious to hear your thoughts on how we evaluate historically the economic development of China in the past 40 years. You know, I just think back to my like introductory economics textbooks where you have a diagram of North and South Korea as an example of a natural experiment between inclusive and exclusive economies. And I'd just be curious to hear how, as economists, you think about evaluating China's growth over the past 40 years and how you reconcile that with the kind of shifting economic policy that Professor Jin was talking about earlier. Great, great question. Larry? In the broadest brush of ways, China had a North Korean economy until 1979. Um, Chairman Mao did all kinds of things that were not the same kinds of gross mistakes that were made in North Korea, but were broadly the same types of mistakes that were made in North Korea. Deng Xiaoping basically made a decision to go as far towards the South Korean economic model as was possible, consistent with maintaining central party, uh, con central party uh, control. And in part because it was starting from such an extraordinarily low base, it engendered uh, tremendous uh, progress. When you have a system where you, to put it very crudely, 200 million people pick rice, and each one gets one 200 millionth of the harvest, and you switch it to a system where everybody gets their own harvest, all of a sudden you get a spectacular improvement in productivity, which then makes it possible for fewer people to pick rice and the economy to branch into all other kinds of activity. So there was miraculous success from the move to uh, the market, followed by great skill in carrying out uh, the uh, reform uh, process. And I think it's fair to say that um, there's a profoundly important historical debate to be had about the fact that the process of reform communism worked much, much better in China than it did in Russia and the republics of the former Soviet Union. Some believe that that is because China wisely avoided a radical rush to the market, preserved planning, and step by step gently, rather than using shock therapy. Others believe that it had to do with the very, very different initial conditions. China was much poorer, China was much more agricultural, 
and that that's what enabled the success. And there are very thoughtful people on both sides of that argument. But I think broadly, it would be market reforms that would be central in the answer. Okay, great question. And that's one we could drill down on for another seminar, but not today. This lady next, please. Hi, my name is Carrie, and I'm a HKS graduate, and then now back as a research fellow. So I have a question for Professor Summers and Professor Jean. Uh, what do you think of the, uh, the dual circulation um, uh, economic policy uh, right now in China, and how do you think uh, that will boost the further boost to the economic growth in the next decade? Okay, so let's see if we can uh, get another big topic, but briefly, Kaya, would you start? I think it's very important um, uh, a trend. A dual circulation represents, at the same time, greater need for technological supply chain independence and self-reliance, which is one of China's focus areas, which is not in contradiction with greater openness. Uh, people tend to conflate the two, but dual circulation is about opening up further Chinese markets, of which there are many, many examples in policy, including the financial sector, and at the same time developing the skills to, uh, to make China's own critical supplies without relying on the U.S. Okay. Uh, given the timing, maybe we'll, if that, I think that's a good answer. It's a big question. We could debate it, but this lady's next. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Bethan Saunders. I'm an MPP1 at HKS. Um, I wanted to follow up on China's view of seeing climate change as an economic opportunity, but also as a tool of soft power. Specifically, how should the US and other Western nations respond to China's efforts to leverage climate mitigation technology and infrastructure as a tool of geopolitical inf uh, influence? For example, their engagement in the South Pacific with smaller island nations like the Solomon Islands um, who ended up actually re downgrading relations with Taiwan in preference to Beijing for support with climate infrastructure. So in my Destined for War book, I have a discussion of this that says the China's, Chinese version of the golden rule says, he who has the gold rules. So <laughs> Kelly? Well, I think um, there's two ways to think about this. Certainly China's commitments in the international arena in the context of the global climate negotiations have been an opportunity for China to exercise soft power in the Joe Nye kind of way we think about it. Um, and indeed, I think in the run-up to the Paris Agreement in 2015, the United States and China were seen as jointly leading the world in this domain. And then after President Trump withdrew, President Xi made a very important strategic decision to stay in the Paris Agreement and demonstrate China's commitment to multilateral problem solving on climate. Um, but I also think we're seeing, and this has sort of the dual kind of two sides of the sword, um, that the point I was trying to make earlier is that China has leaned in hard to new, what they call strategic emerging industries, many of which are the clean industries of the future. And China already controls most of those markets. 80% uh, of the solar PV market is dominated now by China. Um, we could go through you know, wind market, uh, lithium ion batteries, you know, in every case, China has already soared past the United States and already conquered global markets. And I feel like the U.S. has been a little bit asleep during this period, assuming it can catch up or dominate, but already it feels almost too late unless a very concerted action is taken soon. This translates into um, China's ability to deliver these clean technologies to um, developing countries through the Belt and Road Initiative or otherwise, again, kind of controlling the technology that um, is going to be needed by all of these developing countries. So I'm noticing that I'm failing in my job as chair because we're supposed to stop at seven. <laughs> so uh, let me just take this as the last question on the load since you've been very patient. I 
apologize for the many others that are up. If we can have a short question, and we'll try to have a short answer, please. Um, I just want to thank you, sir, uh, for this opportunity. My name is Adam, and I'm a staff member here. Um, my question is in regards to hegemony. Um, compared to Russia, China's having such success in the global market. Um, and think about the playing field that they're in. Uh, basically, half of the world's GDP, when you think about it, is in Asia. Um, we already are seeing China imposing its will on certain countries, and forget countries, organizations such as the World um, WHO, and then even here in the United States, companies here. Um, I think of the NBA and Disney and such. Uh, how far, oh, I'm sorry, how long will it take for the United States to sort of think, as, I guess, think of China as a threat in a sense, because it seems as if we've been allowing this to happen or so, and I understand that China is very far away and such, but I already think of the, um, I'm sorry, the uh, road initiative and how they're connecting Africa to Eurasia. You have access to all these raw materials. They have access to these ports and, and, and such. What will it take for the United States to sort of, I guess, acknowledge China as a potential threat? Perhaps um, Larry. Kayu will have some comments from a Chinese perspective. Um, but I would make this rather different comment from an American uh, perspective, and mine is not going to be the conventional view. I think that China is now seen by virtually everyone in Washington as a major threat. I think that there's enormous alarm, alarm substantially exceeding any alarm that ever existed about uh, Japan, and in some ways alarm at or beyond the level that surrounded uh, the Soviet Union. And I think it's affecting almost every American uh, attitude. And I think the question is what we do about it. And I think what we need to be very careful of, Graham is the world's leading expert on the topic, so I say this with great trepidation, but there is a not implausible view of history, which holds that um, after the United States mobilized itself in a highly truculent way, after Sputnik and around the missile gap, uh, the Soviet Union became very alarmed about its ability to maintain its position its ability to stand strong, and that that encouraged its adventurism with the placement of missiles in Cuba, which caused the most dangerous week in the history of humanity. And I think the danger is that if we react with excessive alarm to what are legitimate concerns, and we start emulating Chinese practices and uh, policies that the world will become a much less stable place. When I was a boy, it would have been inconceivable that Dwight Eisenhower would be regarded today as the fifth greatest president in American history, which is the current view. And if you ask why he was the great American president. It was that in the face of temptation to see threats, raise alarm, and create vicious spirals, he resisted that uh, temptation. And my hope is that that's what we will do uh, today. But I am quite fearful, given prevailing attitudes in Washington, and given that China often seems to be doing everything it can to provoke us into an excessive response with everything ranging from wolf warrior diplomacy to provocative military actions to um, the uh, recent uh, bilateral agreement with uh, President Putin. 
And so my hope is that on both sides, the temperature can be uh, taken uh, down and the goal can be uh, respectful uh, coexistence rather than the triumph of one's own system. I think a very wise comment. I don't know if Caillou wants to say something briefly and Kelly and then I'll do a last blessing, please. From, from the Chinese perspective, the U.S. has left China with no choice but to undertake a series of um, uh, national mobilizations and what we call techno-nationalism to create that kind of technological independence and actually to uh, engage in, I think, Graham's very uh, appropriate uh, title, the Olympic model, which is to mobilize all resources without tallying any costs to achieve the technological independence that China needs because the U.S. has alarmed China after cutting off some of its companies from critical supplies. Now, the question of alarm is a very interesting one because, in turn, uh, China has alarmed the U.S., which is something China has becoming more cognizant of, and that kind of competitive mode and escalation uh, does uh, pose a threat, but it is a practical accommodation to reality. Kelly, you have anything to comment on this? No. Let me just conclude to say what a fantastic session, but I, I think to Larry's point, a profound point, and I agree very much with uh, Caillou's comment, uh, there was a very smart guy who wrote a book about 2,500 years ago his name was Thucydides. He described what happened in classical Greece when the two great city-states uh, found themselves rivals and ultimately at war, a war in which they essentially destroyed each other so much that the Persians came back and ruled them again. And he said famously, it was the rise of Athens and the fear the reaction, including exaggerated fear, almost paranoia, that this instilled in Sparta, that ultimately was the cause of the war. And so I, I think Larry's question is exactly right, that the combination of uh, China's meteoric rise, which I think we have to be ruthlessly realistic in recognizing, but also the reaction that this causes in a ruling power like the U.S., who's not accustomed to not winning gold in everything. I mean, including me, I believe, I would wish we win every race, okay? Uh, in every domain of power that could influence international affairs. And therefore, in especially the Washington craziness today, you have a I mean, what I think is not short of a, de a demonization of China, that's extremely dangerous, that Thucydides told us about the consequences of. And I think Larry's reminder to us that the actions of one of the great states has impact on the perception and the action of another great state. So realizing the ways in which what we do may end up provoking what they do, and that's called a vicious spiral that ends in actions, reactions, and an outcome, uh, and that's called 1914. So I think the stakes here are huge. I think what China has accomplished in its rise is shocking and impressive to me, and it has many positives and many negatives from an American point of view, but I think the real world is we're living with two great powers, two great nations, and they're gonna either find a way on a very small globe to coexist, or they will succeed in co-destructing. And since I think Larry's reminder of both Eisenhower and the reasons why we approve him, but also of JFK for what historians believe, and I believe, was his finest hour in having finally got himself into the Cuban Missile Crisis in a way that he didn't appreciate, 
nonetheless ultimately discovering that you don't leave your adversary with the choice between humiliating retreat and nuclear war. So for the panel tonight, I would just want to say thank you very much, and I apologize that we ran people over late. <laughs>